Good evening and welcome to Coast to Coast Talkback. Our topic this evening is domestic violence mental health issues. It's the last day of January, 31 days, one month in 2022 is already completed. It's a beautiful evening in Guyana. And I hope that those of you who are locked in now on Facebook Live would share the go live and you will tag your friends to come on. This topic is a very, very, very interesting and important one in Guyana. Today's edition comes to you with a kind compliments of Dinesh Auto Spares at 41 Rock Street, Ahmed Hydraulics at Bagotstown, Raise All Seals, 248 Sheriff Street, and Modern Optical Service. Thank you. I have a very distinguished panel this afternoon. And because these, the two gentlemen, the gentlemen here are so modest, they had advised, instructed that their introductions be short. On the top left of your screen is Dr. Sharma, who did his MBBS in Amistar Punjab, postgrad studies in the UK and UWI, holding the doctorate in medicine. He's currently attached as a consultant for neurobehavior medicine at Woodlands and St. Joseph Hospital. He has a record of community service and only recently presented on domestic violence in Region Street. And for those of you who don't know Region Tree where it is, it's the Eskibo, it's the West Demerara Eskibo Island. The other panelists who are present here now, Dr. Mark Constantine, on and off social media and in television, no stranger. Dr. Mark holds a doctorate in clinical psychology. He's a counselor, has been involved in community service, counseling, domestic abuse, mental health issues, lectures throughout Guyana, and has been very vocal on his Facebook page. He's also attached to the Ministry of Health Mental Health Unit. The other gentleman is Mr. Esmond. He's locked in from the United Kingdom by special invitation. We are also going to be having on the panel Ms. Leslie Holder, who is the Assistant <laughs> Director of Nurse and Services at the Georgetown Public Hospital. She is the Vice President of Save Guyana Society and Voluntary Eradication Guyana, of which I am the CEO and President. Domestic violence is a global pandemic. It has recently been rearing its head very often in Guyana. Today, I'm happy to have an esteemed panel that we can attempt to look at the issues and to see the way forward with some possible solutions. This program is not intended as a counseling program. It's merely to highlight the issues. We may discuss some of the do's and the don'ts, and we will take it from there. Feel free to put your comments on the Facebook page and time permits, I will ask my panel to elaborate on that. <clears throat> I want to start first with Dr. Sharma. Dr. Sharma, your opening remarks and you are the person, the neuroscientist for behavioral sciences. sciences. So let us start with Dr. Sharma first. Dr. Sharma. Uh, first, let me thank you, um, Mr. Hussain, for having me on your program and um, look forward to a healthy discussion of this issue. I've got some thoughts that might be provocative in terms of wanting to see the change happen because we've had the problems in our society, but this problem is also ubiquitous. It's around the world and it's more prevalent in some societies tend to be more oppressive. So it has its cultural basis in the way we respect and view our, our uh, other gender, mostly uh, domestic violence is of course not of only gender against gender of different sexes, can be of the same sex relationships. And, you know, so it's got many faces to it. It's got violence in the family setting we talk about the domestic situation being of the family and it impacts the family tremendously negative. Uh, one of the concerns I've had over the years in um, my experiences, it's both lecturing and 
clinician for persons who have been victimized in domestic violence situation. And also in terms of teaching our new, new doctors as to how to best help and cope and also being involved with um, the legal setting, guiding the legal officers as to how to best communicate because communication is also important. We often abuse uh, the persons who have been abused by the way we may speak to them. So it's going to be addressed um, by a number of settings, not just the clinicians. Um, and I'm truly happy that you are taking this on, Mr. Hussein. It's an important issue and we need to open our minds to it and open our minds to solution because at the end of the day, it continues. Despite the efforts, we see it continuing and it wreaks a lot of emotional feelings in us that we see the loss of young people, of anyone, um, to the situation of domestic violence. It's truly, truly painful. And hopefully we, we can prevent the next one from happening. So thank you for having me. Thank you, we'll continue. Uh, Mark, your initial remarks on our topic this evening. All right, um, let me first of all um, extend thanks to you, Nazim, for having me as one of your panel on this program. And to say um, hi to my very good friend and colleague, Dr. Sharma, and to our guest that is with us, who I'm not very familiar with. Um, uh, the whole topic of domestic violence is one that has had a lot, a lot of discussion, and it has had a lot of a lot of discourse and debates surrounding it. Um, however, um, we see that amidst all the talk and amidst all the discussion, uh, domestic violence and and you know, before we ever talk about domestic violence, I like to talk about the domestic abuse because uh, long before the, it becomes violent, there is always that abuse, the psychological abuse and the sexual abuse and, and the physical abuse, and then it actually becomes real violent. But there has been so many discussions uh, over this, so many debates and lectures and, 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 and you know, think tank. But yet still it persists. And uh, um, I think that this program, the focus should really be to find out why is this something that still continue to progress and to escalate amidst every effort that is being made to curtail it. So um, I think, and I do hope that um, this evening, as we put our thoughts and our heads together, we'll be able to come up with some sort of good viable advice and, and, um, and answers to this growing problem that we have. Thank you very much, Dr. 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 Mark Constantine. Um, the viewers and listeners, you would, you, would, you would know that I'm a communicator and one of the things I've learned a long time back is first names really make us being comfortable. You would have observed that Mark is calling me Nassim and I'm calling Mark, Mark because we've <laughs> A very long relationship. And, yeah, we go uh, long that's, that, that's the easiest way. It's not the first time that Mark has been on our programs. And like I said, uh, we are on first name basis. So I need to mm -hmm. caution the audience that there's no disrespect here. Mark is mm -hmm. Dr. Mark Constantine, PhD. Uh, Dr. Sharma is Dr. Devendra, Devendra Nand Sharma. But if sometimes I call him Devendra, it's because of our personal relationships. I see Lesson Hall is trying to come in. But Mark, I'm happy that you, you said um, what you said just now. <clears throat> there are so, so much, a program of this nature cannot address all of the issues. But one of the burning questions, one of the burning questions are, and we'll come to the stigma and the other reasons. One of the burning questions is every time we see I'm going to just say a female now, being brutalized or killed, what asks us to our mind, why did she stay in the relationship? Or let's say he or she stay in that relationship. 
speak for such a long time. And I'm certain that Dr. Sharma might want to start us off by saying, what are some of the reasons why people remain in abusive relationships? Yes. <clears throat> Um, good question there. Uh, so they often stay because of what we we call learned helplessness. So the person who becomes abusive, um, and usually it's a gradual process where they would not have seen those signs in the individual. So it's almost like shocking to the person who is a victim that the person is changing. So they go through a lot of emotions, feeling there's hope. They often blame themselves and they, they feel like, well, I could do better too. Maybe I'm provoking my partner. I, I'm the one that's the wrong one. Um, you know, maybe I, I'm making him drink too much and that's when he, he, he changes. I'm using the word he, I apologize for that. Uh, it could be both sides, um, the gender, or as I said, same genders can have this situation. So there's learned helplessness that happens eventually as a person continues to impose themselves on the victim. They take away their self-esteem, their self-worth. They feel that they will have any life outside of that home. They lose their confidence and they, they, uh, they lose their friends because they often are uh, that's taken away from them. So they become isolated. They become the perfect victim. And that's a very dangerous situation. So that's, you know, not shell as to what happened. You see, Leslin has joined us and good to see you. Yeah, Leslin, I, I can see. Good evening. Uh, Leslin, are you hearing us? I am. <clears throat> I, I'm hearing. Okay, I'm well, here. I, let, me, let, me just, let me just, it would be remiss of me if I do not reintroduce you. I did so in your absence. Uh, Leslin is, Leslin, R, R is for Rose. I have another name for Leslin. Mark, you know, I call Leslin Sumintra because she's a Rose. Uh, Leslin R. Holder. She is the Assistant Director of Nurse and Services at the Georgetown Public Hospital. She is uh, also the Vice President of Suicide and Voluntary Eradication, Guyana. She has been involved in counseling domestic violence and anti-suicide activities for very many years back. She is my colleague in the sense that I'm the president of that organization. Myself and Leslin would have done mental health programs and domestic violence programs all across Guyana from Essequibo in the region, 8 K2, straight across to Burbies at all the secondary schools. So Leslin comes with a wealth of a working experience and knowledge. She's also reading for her master's in mental, in, in health, public health presently. So Leslin comes with a wealth of, of, of experience as well. Leslin will come to you just now. Mark, uh, society normalizes unhealthy behavior so people do not understand when they're in a relationship that the relationship is abusive. <clears throat> I'm talking about the society that makes it attach so much stigma of wanting to leave a, an abusive relationship. Do you wanna elaborate on society that normalizes unhealthy behavior so people may not understand that a relationship is abusive? You know, yeah. um, um, Dave just mentioned something in his opening remark. He, he, he spoke about culture. And, uh, you know, when you look at, at domestic abuse, and by extension, domestic violence, um, culture plays a tremendous, tremendous um, part in that. And uh, I have always um, said that anything that is condoned or allowed long enough tends to become a norm um, or accepted as a norm in society. And uh, this is what, um, is the case when it comes to domestic abuse and domestic violence. It has been accepted and condoned for so long, right, that it is now seen as normal. The other thing is that culturally, you have abusers, those persons that do the abusing, who grew up in cultures and grew up in families and communities that, that they grew up and they see these sort of things. And because it is something that has become ingrained um, in their mind, um, to them it is, it is normal and it's good both for victim um, as well as perpetrator, right? I, I'm, I'm gonna tell you something that I, I saw when I was 
um, just a, a teenager growing up, there, there was a young man, and he was relatively young, who had a partner, and he used to beat her mercilessly. And uh, this girl used to come to my mother, and my mother used to ask her, well, why do you tolerate and, and, and allow this gentleman to do that to you? And, and she said, he does that because he loves me. It is only because he loves me he would do things like that. And, and this is something that, that has been taught, right? And when, when you have um, the person that is being abused um, with low self-esteem issues, and you have individuals who have dependency issues, and when we say dependency, let us not run away with the notion of, of believing that we're talking about financial um, dependence true. alone. We're talking emotional dependency and all of these sort of things because they might have grown up in, in a home, um, you know, where those sort of um, things lack the love or, or whatever you want to call it. And and, and, and and strangely, people consider those things love. Can you believe that? So, so, so there's a lot that contributes to the acceptance of it. A whole a host of different things that we can talk about. But the dependency is one of the key things that stands out to me and the culture, you know, how people are cultured and how they are nurtured and believe is normal. Excellent. Um, you know, you know there, there are several forms of domestic abuse, of course. And when we right. talk about right. domestic violence, our first thought is the abuse being meted out by a male to a female. But mm -hmm. there is a great percentage of male, males reward, who suffer reward. domestic abuse. But for the present circumstances, I want to focus on the abuse being meted out basically by men. Now, Leslie, you know, there's a movie, a 1944 black and white movie. It was entitled Gaslight, starred Ingrid Bergman and Charles Boyer. That movie talks about emotional control. Control. Controlling behavior in a way for the abuser to maintain dominance over the victim. I'd encourage any one of our viewers and listeners this evening to go to YouTube and you may find the movie is Gaslight. So we refer sometimes to gaslighting as the controlling behavior. Leslin, you have had experiences and I'm certain that you would like to share your experiences before we go into the professional discussion. Leslin Holder. Hi, yes, um, once again, thanks for having me. Um, you know, I personally suffered um, domestic violence. And um, like Mark said earlier, um, you know, when, you, when you're in a situation where um, it, is made, it is made to feel normal uh, by society, um, and especially if you're young and inexperienced, you know, you, you tend to want to um, do the right thing, which is the wrong thing. So for example, um, my first marriage was a very abusive one. And um, when I spoke of divorce and trying to get out of it, um, I was told that it is not the right thing to do. Um, you know, a, a good Christian girl don't get divorced. Um, you try to work on the marriage and um, see where it goes. Um, all along, the, the, the abuse continues. Um, so I, I can share so, so many um, bad experiences, you know, but I, I think the key thing here is for us to um, understand, you know, as a society, um, what is needed? What, what can we do? Um, the one thing that helped me to redeem myself, um, I, I didn't have help. There, there, there was no place to go. The, the people I spoke to, it was, you know, the same thing. You know, it's your marriage. You, 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 you're, you're young. You have a child. You have to stay in the marriage for the child um, for religious reasons. Um, the Bible says when you're married, so, 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 so. And, you know, um, what, what can we do to... To, um, to change that? What can we do to, to, to break that sort of trend or, or, or culture? How can we change the culture? 
Um, so what I did for myself is um, I realized that, you know, for me not to be so weak and submissive and, and um, listen to everyone else than myself, I knew what I was going through. And I, somewhere in the back of my head, I knew what I had to do. And it was only until I, I think I was strong enough emotionally, um, financially, and in, in every sense knew, well, this is about me. Um, if, if I don't do this for me, I don't think, I couldn't see anybody trying to help me there. Um, it, it was one of the, the most um, empowering thing I could have done for myself. I, I never imagined walking away would have been so easy um, because of the abuse, obviously, and the threats and everything else. You know, it was also scary. It was very scary. You leave, if you leave, this is what's going to happen. You can't leave. You, um, you know, it, it, it was one thing to, to, to the next. I remember waking up um, a boxing day in one of the private hospitals in an unconscious state in an unconscious state for three days. So it was, okay, so you're not gonna have me back. So I'm gonna kill the both of us. But I was the one who ended up because it was my side of the vehicle that got, you know, when I realized, you know, this is, this, this is my life and I have to take control. I, I was able to do it. Um, I made sure that I was financially secure. I'm a nurse by background. Um, in those days, nurses didn't earn any money. I mean, nurses still don't earn a lot of money, but I made sure that I can survive on my own without having to depend on that. Once I, once I broke that, and I knew that, well, I, even if I earn $10, it's my $10, right? Um, the other thing was, um, so the, the friends who would tend to want to, you know, who you would tend to want to listen to um, more in the negative. I, I stopped listening to those friends. In fact, I realized I had to stop even meeting with the, those friends. I have to sort of like break away from, from, from some of my friends because of, of how they felt about it. And, you know, the influence they had on me. Um, I remember I'm not a, I wasn't a rude child. And I remember my mom said to me, um, she said, I stayed in my marriage for 25 years because of so, so, so my, my stepdad died. So she said, when, when he died, I was free. And I said to her, well, I am not so sure that I can wait for 25 years until this man dies. I might die before then, you know, or I might become violent myself I did become violent. I became very violent, right? And I was lashing out. I was injuring him and, and you know, I could have, it could have been any, any one of us in the hospital at any time. So I had to do a lot of, you know, soul searching and I had to do this for me. Now there is help, right? There is help. There's a mental health unit. There's so many groups, there's NGOs like us. And I think what is still lacking is the awareness of people knowing where to go, right. you know, what we'll, help is available, yeah, we'll, what we'll, assistance we'll come, we can. We'll come back <laughs> to you, Leslie. And one of the things that we all know here is that abuse thrives on silence. And that is why we're trying to get people to break the silence. They must speak out and put spotlight on the issues. But the statistics have shown that 70% of the persons who have been physically abused were so abused after they decided to leave the relationship. 70% is a world stats for people after they have left the abusive relationship. I now ask Dr. Sharma to talk to us about emotional abuse and intimidation. Dr. Sharma, emotional abuse and intimidation. Yeah, sorry, I was looking for the unmute button. Um, so, emotional abuse is, to my mind, uh, 
sometimes worse than the physical abuse. It, it really erodes the person's emotional health. And that's a part of individuals that is not easy to fix because many a time they don't even recognize it to themselves. That the emotional health is going down until they feel so depressed that they start to feel suicidal and they wanna end their lives. So it's a gradual process of depression that results from emotional abuse. The end result is often suicide. And that's a, a truly a sad event that we see so often in our society of Guyana. So it's about calling people names. It's about putting them down. It could be even very subtle. It's about say that you can't manage without me. Uh, I'm, I'm everything for you. It, it, remove their self-confidence. It takes away their self-esteem. It takes away their, their support system. So there's, there's so much to that part of abuse that is often not recognized as very, very bad. And as in my mind, as bad as the physical abuse. After the perpetrators are punished for physical abuse, but those who are abused emotionally are not as, as punished as significantly uh, by the legal system. Well, both parties in Achifaka um, seem to, to not have enough punishment as it is. And the question also, does punishment truly work? But that's a different story. I think we'll touch on that a little bit. But coming back to that, that's the way emotional abuse works. It, it's subtle sometimes. Um, the person makes snide comments or is constantly negative or sarcastic. I know one victim who told me that uh, she couldn't feel like going home after work because it was something to, to not enjoy because she don't know what criticism was going to be made. Everything was not right that she did, but her dress was not right, her friends were not right. Um, there was nothing right that she could do. So it's truly, a horrible experience with somebody in that kind of home environment. Excellent, excellent so far. Uh, Mark, you want to add to that or do I ask you to comment on another form of domestic violence, isolation? Isolation. Well, well, let me just, um, just to support what um, Dave is saying, you know, when, we, when you look at the emotional aspect of abuse, it is one that a lot of attention, you know, usually it's not given a lot of attention. Um, but before, in my view, and, and from, you know, being involved in this sort of thing for a long time, I think that emo the emotional aspect of abuse is what comes before every other aspect of abuse. Before you can, you can, you can, um, deal any other form of, of abuse to a person. And in this case, as you said, we're talking man to woman. It, it usually starts with the emotional aspect of the abuse. And as they've said, it's you know, taking away their sense of um, their self-worth, they're lowering their self-esteem, um, making them feel valueless is coercion. And, and it, it, it's basically designed to break the person. And once you can break the person psychologically, right, and emotionally, that is where the control factor comes in, right? So um, I just really needed to add that to understand, um, um, for our viewers and listeners to understand that, you know, before every aspect, every other aspect of abuse, usually is emotional abuse is the one that comes before all of it. Um, before, before I wanted to, to, to ask a uh, lesson to share with you on the cycle of abuse. You know, after this has been this has been happening very regularly. The cycle of abuse. After every abusive incident comes a makeup honeymoon phase, and then the person being abused say, "Okay, everything is okay again," and they continue until they're abused again, and then the honeymoon phase comes in. Lesson, can you elaborate on that? Perhaps you might want to share a personal experience of that. Um, yes. And, you know, 
I, I recall I, I had a friend. So we were in both of us were in abusive relationships, but she didn't see it as abuse. She she actually um, used to say things like, you know, um, her, her husband worked away a lot and in the interior and um, she used to want him to come home um, and they must have this huge row and fight, even physical fight and, um, and then make up. Um, to be honest, I, I can't, you know, personally relate to that, maybe some aspect of it, but um, you know, I I never find myself oh you know wanting that or desiring that. I I thought that was totally crazy, you know. Um, I mean at that time I could I couldn't really advise her much because um I I too lacked the the education on it, but but yes um and that is so. So I've I've read somewhere that um. That this happens because um, it 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 seems like the person is seeking forgiveness and um, in in doing so it it sort of um, helps the person to get back into some sort of you know relationship with you without um, feeling guilty like it's a form of approval or something. Um, other than that, I heard that the makeup sex is quite good. Um, if I can add that piece to it, um, you know, and you know, it's it's amazing and it's and it's true. Uh, you know, the things um, we can be um, we can be subjected to, which is to me, like Mark said, all a part of the 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 mental control. Right, all a part of the mental control. Um, you know, it 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 clearly shows that so, sometimes in 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 some aspects there's there's a mixture of it. And like he rightly said, you know, the emotional abuse comes first. You know, I think if if when I look back and I think of things, you know, maybe I could have seen signs of it earlier, and maybe I could have avoided a lot of the the abuse meted out to me. But um, I, I never really looked at it as that. And one of the reasons I never looked at it as abuse because uh, we grew up in a home where my mom was abused. Our, our home was an abusive home. So I, you know, I always thought that you know, we're to be cursing and, and swearing and hitting and pushing and shoving and so on, and that those things were, were sort of normal. Um, until I realized how they, they, they made me feel, then I realized, you know, that this, this isn't right. Something isn't right here. You know, I, I wrote a book um, to try to motivate young women um, about, um, you know, getting up, getting back on your feet um, after, you know, suffering I, violence, domestic violence or any other tragedy that, that you might be. Um, and it wasn't until I, I was speaking to someone, I realized I needed some help. Um, and although I was in the medical field, I, I thought, you know, speaking to somebody might help. So my doctor said, look, I, I know somebody I'll send you to. And in conversation, he said, you know, there's a lot that you need to get out there. He said, I think you should write it down you know, start writing it down. And I, I did that. And I didn't realize, you know, how much I had there, um, you know, in the back of my mind of, you know, what I tolerated, what I could have avoided, what I could have avoided uh, for me and, and for my abuser, what I could have avoided. Maybe I could have, you know, seek help for both of us or I, I don't know. But, you know, there, there there's there's so much that, um, is unaddressed, but people have to have the awareness. Great, excellent. Uh, there are several issues that we want to cover this afternoon, and it may sound as if I am I am going helter skelter. But as the thoughts come, I want to present them and ask that our panelists discuss them and shed some illuminate. Illuminate, Dr. Sharma. What rule? You know, people, people, especially men. Uh, what, if they're having what is called a domestic issue at home, which is they themselves being abused by sometimes 
uh, spousal withhold of, withhold of sex. They're not getting the food they want to eat. Uh, the, the, the wife they're claiming is always nagging. So what they do, they refer, revert to substance abuse. What is the role of substance abuse in domestic violence, Dr. Sharma? Yes, so yes. the big role in um, many of our ills of society, uh, especially alcohol, which is very commonly abused in Ghana. And also it's a sort of cultural way of dealing with many problems that people go to the bar and rum shops and talk their problems out to their friends and then they go back home and when they become energized and they got some confidence and they become able to talk through or talk about what they're experiencing instead of just talking in a decent way, the alcohol tends to provoke passion, anger, and often physical violence. So alcohol is a major factor also in when a crime is committed. The, the justice system doesn't look at alcohol as an excuse that if somebody commits a violent act, physical violent act, that even can end somebody's life as a mitigating factor. The person has taken responsibility for drinking or using other drugs, and then they go on to commit violence. So going back to what Leslie is saying, people have to learn to take a healthy road to solving problems. There is a need for people to deal with those problems by talking through them. Try to rekindle the, the relationship that they had um, and find solutions. I often say that when people are fighting, it's because they still care for each other. It doesn't mean that it's the end. It's when the, I, I see many a times it's when people show no, no care anymore. They don't, they're not even bothered about what the partner is doing. Yes. They're just living there in a home that it's almost that they're divorced. They go through what they call the emotional divorce. And so they don't, they're not bothered. They're doing their own thing. So that's a very, very bad sign. And that tells you the relationship is over and the chances of recovery is low. So it is not so hopeless, you know, um, Mr. Hussein, that we see them behaving even in an irritable fashion. What should not be done is for people to drink or use drugs because that is going to make their brains go out of control. And once they lose that control, it's very difficult in a moment of passion and anger for them to hold back that violent act. And that is just one moment, just one single moment they, they act you can spend 20, 30 years in jail, remorse, it's not going to take back that moment. So that is a moment that is considered the great evil that is being punished on. The courts don't look too much about how good this man is in society or whatever he did or that lady may be. They look at the, 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 the behavior. Uh, to some credit to the court, I often, I'm a bit harsh when it comes to my legal systems, but uh, to some credit, they, they actually do. They're, we do have our social workers and we do have persons who will plea for mitigation. So they, to some extent, they do have a look at the history of the person. But when the partners have seen each other start to turn to drink as a way of coping, truly, truly unhealthy. It's not the way. Thank you, thank you. Uh, Mark? and to the entire panel and all those are listening. One of the things that we learn is that provocation is no excuse for abuse. And the abuser's anger is no excuse for abuse either. Mark, what is the role of counseling in preventing domestic violence? Or how do you see counseling being an important role? Um, it is of absolute importance to those who would seek it. It can be useful. It can be tremendously helpful to those who will seek it. And, and because of the general stigma that exists when it comes to, to persons seeking mental health services, you know, a, a lot of men who need this um, so, sort of, of service, they, they, do not, they do not come for it. 
they do Why? not try to access it. I, I think I think one is the stigma. Um, there is this belief that a man is supposed to go and tell no, no other man his, his story and, 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 his, and what, what's going on with him because um, it might make him feel like he is less of a man. He weak and he can't handle his business. And, and so he withholds himself from, from going and, and accessing the service. Then again, it has also to do with how men have generally been cultured men have got to demonstrate some sense of control and macho-ness um, and all of that. And then there's the, the ego factor. Men are, men are you know, very ego-driven. And so they, they don't step out and seek that sort of um, help. But you know, what I find is that education plays a major role. And uh, I, I see that there's a lot of um, a good number of younger men whom are stepping out and getting help, right? Talking to someone. And I have found that, um, I've been checking on it, that a lot of men who get themselves involved in, in being abusive to women, a lot of them grew up seeing that one, and a lot of them grew up in, in, in households and in communities where they did not have um, this male figure or how to deal with, you know, um, that wholesome and holistic way. And so what, what the music video teaches them, what other men in the community teaches them, and what they believe is the way um, to, to handle their business, that's what they do. But counseling, getting someone to talk to, um, definitely can put someone in a position where they see where they are going wrong. And sometimes that's all a person, you know, really needs is for someone to talk to them. You know, if I may throw this in, a, a couple of years ago, um, somewhere around maybe 2014, 2013, there about, when I was involved with the prison reform program, I remember visiting um, the Tumeri prison specifically one day. And we had over 100 inmates in a, in a large room and uh, I, was, I was talking to them about anger management. And I remember asking a hundred plus men, how many of you are in here because you made a bad decision and choice due to anger? You, 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 you allowed your anger to get a bad decision. And three quarters of them, young and old, and, and, and many of them said to me, they said, if we knew what you told us back then, we probably wouldn't be sitting in here today. So you see the counseling definitely helps and it's very, very useful. Thank you. You would agree with me, uh, the entire panel and all those listening. One of the issues primarily in Guyana has been the male ego image. Ego, and yeah. the male ego if ego feeling that he's macho they're not men are not supposed to cry which is erroneous and not like you rightly said talk to you about your issues with others because you will you will think that your friends or the other persons you talk to will think that you are not good enough as a man one of the most taunting things for a man however is for and this i have listened i've heard this i've actually seen this one of the most taunting things is when women in a portray abusive relationship, give the man the impression that the reason why, and I'm talking here now about cheating, gives the man the impression or causes him out to say he is not ready yet, meaning she's talking about his sexuality, his manhood. That is one. The other thing is that <clears throat> one of the things that happens in Guyana that I've experienced as a young man growing up is that we sometimes feel pride in our sons or male children having many girlfriends. And we say, the man's a stud. But we do not feel the same way about our girl children because she's, she's having multiple relationships. You are hurt about it. Our society has been tolerating male dominance for too long. And I dare say that perhaps that male dominance is what we are suffering from now. <clears throat> I'm, I'm not talking here about women equality and things like that. I'm talking about 
tolerating violence for mean for male dominance. You get a drift. Um, Dr. Dr. Sharma. Dr. Sharma, are you hearing me? Yeah, sorry. Yeah. I, I mute the mic because of background noise. So um, yeah, absolutely. The, the male dominance is, is a factor. The cultural issues are a factor. We, we see certain regions that have problems and um, it's the way persons are brought up. I agree with Mark in terms of what he's saying. Those, those persons in prisons could be persons who are going to give society um, some benefits and we, we are locking them away. Um, they have committed crimes, um, but those crimes could have been prevented. We know counseling does work. How do we change the persons as they grow up? That's the big issue. How do we make those homes that are dysfunctional better? How do we help those children who have poor parental role models? What can we do? They, they already in the in the boat, you know, the boat has sailed. The, the parents are young parents. Why is there a culture in Guyana where young girls are getting involved with these macho guys that are using them for sexual relations? They give their, their emotions to them. They fall in love and then these guys move on. They, they, it's a pattern, they're not seeing it and it becomes a pattern in our society. Young parents making young children who go on to make young, young children as they become young parents. You mentioned the cycle. The cycle is within our life, within our society. It has to be stopped. Unless it's stopped, this, this pattern of dysfunctional behavior will continue. The, the role models are not there. Um, so the thing is, it's not that they don't want to be role models. They, they don't have the role model to look at. If you take us back into time in terms of where we came from, uh, even now, fathers are neglecting their homes. Many mothers have to become the, the father and mother. Where are they going to get his father that they're going to look up to? He's off, you know, in his rum shops. The rum shop is the home in, in our country, and that is not healthy. It's, you know, we, we accept it. And it's, it's not right. I mean, the, the, the moms are crying out for their dads to be there, to be leaders in their home, and they're not taking the leadership. And then when they become the leaders, the men get angry and they start to, to get violent towards them. What are they supposed to do? It's a matriarchal society. Don't you agree, Leslie? I mean, I see that. It's not owning Guyana. It's a Caribbean culture. It's unhealthy. OK, you know, uh, Mark had earlier spoken about well, the hint on economic abuse. One of the reasons that I have discovered that many women, especially from the country areas and all other areas in Guyana, have been staying in, in abusive relationships is because of empowerment, financial and otherwise. But, think of it, I have known persons who are economically empowered, women especially. I know of a judge who told me once that she is in a, in a, in a in a physically abusive relationship, and she's even earning more than her husband. I know of a lawyer that told me the same thing, and I'm certain, counselor, I'm certain that Mark and 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 Dave and even Leslie, you have encountered persons who are economically empowered but are still in abusive relationship, because it is said that you know the 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 financial abuse is a way to control the victim through the manipulation of economic resources, but that is not the only thing that is causing the domestic violence we're seeing. Mark, you want to elaborate on that? Um, as, as I would have said earlier, um, the, the financial dependency is just sometimes one very small factor um, to consider why a lot of women stay in abusive relationships. There is the emotional dependency um, that one needs to consider and you're quite correct i have known women whom um are in far better uh financial position as it relates to income than their spouses but and their 
they're they're living on the tremendously um, abusive relationship, but still staying in it. Um, so the, there's the emotional dependency one has to consider. Then, um, as Leslin would have mentioned, and I would have said earlier, there's the cultural um, factors to consider how society is going to view you and what society would have to say about you and your family if you should um, leave that relationship. Then um, there, there's some religion and religious groups that, that um, is totally against a person leaving a marriage once he or she is in it. Um, they, they, they see it as, as a scorn on the family and on the woman if she leaves. You are supposed to, you are supposed to stay in that relationship at all costs and make it work. Um, my grandmother was taught that and she was told that and she stayed amidst the abuse from my grandfather, right? And she stayed um, and, and because that is what she was taught, what do you think she would have done in turn? She would have taught her daughters the same thing. You know, I stayed, why can't you stay, right? And, and so the religion that we practice, the, the culture, and the emotional control and, and, and societal stigma that is usually sometimes placed in our family um, in general. What is the community going to say? Because there's always that factor of fear that the man will turn around and say that the reason why that marriage broke up or that relationship broke up is because the woman was no good in some way. And the, and the blame game is going to turn around on the family to make them look bad. So there's a lot of different things to, to consider, but I agree with you. Um, the, the financial dependency is not the only one to consider. There's a whole lot of other things that one needs to consider. Thank you. Before I leave uh, open mic so that we can have other comments, Leslin, the role of infidelity in domestic violence. Um. <clears throat> In, in, in my opinion, and, and obviously it's out there, um, you know, one way or the other, you know, none of us like to be cheated on, right? Um, however, it, 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 it shouldn't have to resort to um, violence. I, I think infidelity in itself is, is a form of emotional abuse. Um, I don't know if that is the view of anybody else, but I, I share that view. That, yeah, if anybody feels cheated on, well, you know, that is that is a form of abuse. And obviously people will react. People will react um, with anger. People will react um, through violence and so on. Um, and I, 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 I also believe that, you know, if, if people have to be unfaithful to each other, Maybe they shouldn't be together, you know, but um, this is life and these things happen. And um, if, you know, if you have the support and the intelligence to, to move on and, and get past it, you know, I think it should be done in a way, you know, where I, I do believe that counseling helps, you know, it, it, it helps. I've, I've had, um, I've, I've heard, I know of people personally who, um, who had, you know, experienced infidelity on both sides, and um, they wanted to save their marriage. Um, you know, it was bad for a while, and it got better with counseling and so on. So, you know, it goes to show that these things work. Um, it, it should not, no matter what, you know, come to violence and eventually um, loss of life. I, I think that is the that is what we have to focus focus on um you know as as a country as a people as a society you know how we can help people to get help and you know prevent death prevent suicide prevent um what is it more the suicide you know those are the things we have to focus on okay listen i hear you loud and clear uh i have a special guest as you're seeing him and i did not give him an opportunity to voice a comment yet. Edmund is all the way in the United Kingdom, and I think he's not very well. He's in bed right now. 
Edmund, you want to share a comment or a view right now? He has to yeah. unmute his mic. You have to unmute your mic. All right, while Edmund is getting, Edmund, are you hearing us? I'd like to acknowledge Dr. Sudesh Saw, who is locked in as a neuromedicine specialist, and Roxanne Sandy, who is in the UK. She is a health professional, has been involved. She's a very strong supporter of Save Guyana and our work that we do here in Guyana because she's Guyanese, but she lives in the UK. Edmund, can you hear us now? All right, do you want to share a comment, Edmund? It's going to take on, on mute. Unmute your mic. All right, we'll come back to Ed. Dr. Sharma, I do not want to posit any other questions for you to talk on. I want to give you an opportunity now to discuss mental health, domestic violence. The floor is yours. And you give me about you give me about a, a day and a half. <laughs> yeah, okay. We'll come back again. <laughs> but take a few minutes. No, yeah. So um well when we talk about mental health, we're talking about the brain, we're talking about people's emotions. And the word mental to oh, me yeah. carries really negative connotations. So I personally am not the one that talks about mental health as a, a disorder, I think it's taken away from, and it's added, added to the stigma of people who have these disorders. That's one of the reasons I've seen many Guyanese who don't come out for treatment, who suffer in silence. And there's a reason why they suffer in silence, because they feel that they're going to be exposed to the community. There's going to be people who are going to point fingers and that's also one of the reasons we see them staying in these relationships, apart from losing their, their powers to take, a, take, a, take the road as Leslie did, empower herself, become a person of autonomy and be able to manage her life. And that is great. But, you know, we really truly want to see people, families work. We want to see that they make it through life and that they... The children are enjoying their parents. Children suffer when parents are violent to each other and when they break up the, the home and move apart. The, the children do feel it. We know the studies are showing that it impacts on our kids' emotional health. So I, I talk about emotional health. Um, that I say the brain is what we consider mental health is about how people think, how people behave, and how they feel. And that's a very, very important part of our lives. And persons who prefer to go and talk about their physical problems, but when you ask them about their feelings of that, they don't even know what you're talking about because it's something that should not be talked about. And we have to get over that. We have to learn that that part of our body, the brain is the most important part of our bodies. What are you hiding from? What are you so embarrassed about? I know people who, whose home are in distress, their kids are suffering, the behavior of the kids are bad, they, they turn to drugs, they turn to alcohol, and the parents are all quiet about it. In social settings, they behave as if there's nothing going on, yet behind closed doors, it's, it's a horror, a horror movie. Uh, you don't need to see a horror movie, you need to go to the home when they close the doors, when they're inside there. And that's the kind of privacy that people have. It's not private, the self-deception. Yes, I, I know people prefer to keep their, their businesses quiet. I agree, there should be privacy. But, but there is a point where you have to reach out for help. And that help, as um, we heard this evening, Mark said it, Leslie said it, and I see it, that helps make a difference. And everybody who can intervene, intervene. Don't wait for when the end comes and say, you know, I could have done better. Do it. Pastors are hearing, uh, the preachers are hearing, the pandits are hearing cases of violence. Don't just pray it out. Yes, please pray. But please also refer to professionals. 
This whole issue of treated emotional health is not just a wishy-washy thing. Not everybody can do it. You have to be even trained. Even if they mean well, even if they mean well, well, but they're not. You got to be a professional. You know, you could do harm instead of good. Yes. So yes. you got to understand the person as a person. When I hear somebody like Mark speak, I, I feel a great sense of happiness because we we've got a good man in our country. These are the people who must be the leaders in these programs to help make that change. When I hear Leslie talk and what she's doing, it has to be promoted. We must encourage it. They cannot do it alone. So my, my take here is that it can be done, but it's not an easy task. It cannot be brushed under the carpet. We must open the doors, let it come out, let people talk freely. Yes, we are talking to many listeners here this evening who are very, very wise and very sensible. But we got plenty of people who should be here on this program listening who are probably in the rum shop. How do we reach those people? Those are the people who should be listening to Mark and Leslie when they talk about their experiences, when those, when those persons can open their minds to their own feelings and accept the truth, we will get true healing. Thank you, Mark. Can, can you um, continue? Can you continue from where Dave left off? Um, well, you know, over the years, Nazem, we personally, me and you, we would have had so many discussions, you know, um, that surround this very same topic. And um, the, the problem, as I said, from the very onset is one that continues to grow. And sometimes it would leave some people to wonder whether their effort is making any sense. But um, I, I, I just would like to say, you know, as Dave said it, you know, every effort is an effort that is necessary, right? Because your effort may very well save another life. Uh, not only just save another life, but it might very well keep a family together. Um, you know, the fact remains, and I, I, I remember Leslie saying this when she first spoke, that, you know, religion teaches you sometimes that, you know, you, you, you should stay in and, and because of how you were brought up religiously, work. Well, I know this, I, I pastored for, for close to two decades, 20 years, I pastored in a senior position. And... Um, I had a total different approach, and and um, I remember one time there, there there was a couple um in the community where I was pastoring, and 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 I tried every method that I could have tried with this guy, and he was just outright abusive. He had uncontrolled anger issues. Um, some 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 factors with him was that he was also um, he inherited some some traits, you know, of of anger and abuse you know, from, from family. And um, I remember one day, a Sunday morning, but she did not know how because of dependency factors and control. The term, let me just put it in a nutshell. I separated those two people that day. That Sunday morning, I separated them, literally separated them. And, and, you know, today I want to tell you that um, the two children, they had two children stayed with the father because the woman did not really know where she was going. But she left because she had that support. And uh, she left and she went to one of her sisters somewhere till in, in Barbies in another region. Make a long story short, today she's in the U.S., remarried, got children from that new union that, that um, she's in now. Her children from that relationship that she was in are now grown and married themselves. Um, her husband is still around, he never remarried. But, you know, sometimes it is necessary to, to take that bold step and do such thing, right? And not allow, you know, not allow good sense, stopping good sense from prevailing, right? So. Um, I, did, I think that the time has come where we need to be a little bit more bold. We, we have to be bold and stop, stop beating around the bush when it comes to this whole topic of domestic abuse because it continues to damage the social 
fabric of our society and it continues to ruin relationships and, and families by extension and um we just need to be vocal about so mark, it. mark mark will you say then that it's vital that our society build the self-esteem and develop coping skills because of the many challenges that can be faced in a family with both male and females Absolutely. The, the, the skills to cope in any situation is, is vitally important. I think the reason why people react negatively to situations is because they don't have the proper way of coping with it. And so it's definitely so that proper coping skills needs to be embraced, um, needs to be taught, first of all, because some people just don't know how. A person cannot do what they don't know to do. They will do what they know to do. It's simple as that. And unless we educate them, unless they are taught, um, we're going to continue <laughs> that. But it is definitely vitally important. Well, I, I for one would love to see, not only convened by myself, many other programs of this nature, because uh, many of the people now have access to, to social media. And I would have imagined that we can have continuous discussions, training programs. I do know that the ministry is working a lot on, on, on these training sessions, the mental health unit as well, they're working a lot on these sessions. Before we close, I will, I, I will give you some of the legal perspectives of mental health, of, of domestic violence, and where you can contact, who you can contact, and things like that. But Mark, um, does your unit do domestic violence counseling? I know you do that on a professional level individually, but does the mental health unit do any counseling for mental, for physical abuse, for domestic Absolutely. abuse? Absolutely. You know, if, if I may say this, and I, I did not talk to my superiors about, about saying this, but um, I don't think there's going to be any harm to it. The mental health unit, as we know, provides um, that sort of services um, where one can come in and, and ask to talk to a counselor or a psychologist and, or whom a mental health um, counselor. Um, but as of recent, I know that there are moves afoot to start to decentralize the services that we offer there to every health center um, and regional hospitals across the country, which is good news for me. Oh, yeah, that's um, excellent news. Yes. And I think that is excellent news so for anyone in, in, in this area. Especially when, we, when, especially, especially when we, many of us uh, get the impression that George Tong is Diana. This is... Very good news. Correct. That Correct. Point. Correct. Um, tra traveling to, to, to come to Georgetown sometimes from a different region is a challenge all by itself, um, especially for a family that may be facing some sort of economic difficulty. Um, so the services are there. And, and I think as time progresses, um, the public is going to be advised where they can, they can access this sort of services, which health center, which regional hospital. Um, social workers are being placed in, in, in these hospitals as well and health centers um, and, and, and such like. So um, the services are there. Then there's the Ministry of, of Human Services also, apart from the Ministry of Health. You have a lot. There are countless NGOs. They put themselves and publicize themselves enough. But there's a lot of NGOs that are offering services and help. Well, and some of the I, NGOs you're talking, let me just make, make, make an issue. I do know of Crossroads, Suicide and Mental Health Awareness, and their numbers are 667-2692. But persons who are desirous of getting these, they're easily accessible if you Google. But yes, the Mental Health Unit, the Human Services, the National Suicide Helpline, Guyana Foundation, Monique Kelpin Hands, Save Guyana, right. and you can call us at 644-1152 or 639-1189, um, so you can get help. Yeah, you can continue, Mark, sorry. Continue, Mark. Yeah, yeah absolutely. So, so the services are there. Um, um, you know, religious people, they go to church and such like, but, you know, I'm gonna tell you this from, from experience. Sometimes you have a couple that is going to a church every Sunday but yet still there is a view in the home. And, and, and but when they go to church, it's painted 
um, to make people believe that everything is, is, is okay and dandy, whereas it is not. Um, I just think that it is important that, that um, persons talk to their pastor or talk to their pandit or whoever the leader is. Yes, a lot of them might not be trained to deal with it, but perhaps maybe they can direct you to someone somewhere um, that can, you know, offer that help. And I want to say this, if you know you are not competently trained um, to offer real professional help to individuals, please don't make it worse by trying to, I understand an effort is an effort, but, you know, direct them to the professional. Well, it's a cardinal rule. Um, and I'm certain that um, by now many people know this, that many people would have, you know, a good intention, but they do not have the training and they can just make it worse. Leslie, in your views. Leslie, in your views. Um, <clears throat> yes, indeed. Um, you know, as, as a layman, you know, we can try to help. Um, I'm, I'm a nurse by background and I've been a nurse for a long time and um, patient counseling and patient teaching is all a part of what um, nurses do, um, but I understand my own limitations um, and I would always, you know, help as far as I can go. Um, you know how much we've done um, through Save Guyana, but we would always um, refer the person on. I like to, um, I like to, you know, be able to say to people, to persons, um, you know, I can only help you this far. I can I can continue to, to help you to get help. Um, and, and, you know, I would do it that way because, um, you know, we're, we're generally helping people and good people, you know, we want to reach out and we want to help. But that is that is an important thing for us to understand our own limitations and try to help the person to get the right help in a timely manner. Listen, you know, I, I really love the story that you tell about the prisoner when you were working in the UK and you understood your limitations then as you understand now and I understand mine uh, because I too am a layman like you. But I just want you to share that quickly, the story about when you were working in the prison in the UK as a nurse and did not have any mental health training, mental wellness training at the time. All right. <laughs> Nazim, the things you remember. Yeah, so I, I was a prison nurse for two years and um, not being a mental health nurse, um, but we, and we were always short of mental health nurses. So being the nurse in charge this day, I decided that, you know, I, I think I should take myself down to the admissions. There was a rule, you have to be a mental health nurse by qualification to do admissions because there's a mental health aspect. So, um. At admissions, this young guy, 20, um, he was there and um, he said he was going to suicide. Um, once he's admitted, he was going to suicide. So um, I, re I, I recall, you know, some key things. If somebody says they're going to suicide, ask them about a plan. Plan, the plan, the plan. Yes, he didn't quite have a plan. So I thought, okay, I... He said he, he's not sure how he's going to do it because he doesn't quite understand the resources available to him in prison, um, but he was going to do it anyway. So I took that and I, I said to the security, look, I need to go. I need to go to health care. And um, they thought I was one crazy nurse, for, you know, taking a prison prisoner to myself to, to the health care, how the prison was situated. It was a lot of walking, but I had some other important errands to run. So there I was with a, a, a pris prisoner on my arm and I was taking him with me where I had to go run the errand before we went back to healthcare. And everybody was looking down thinking, you know, who the hell is this crazy nurse with a prisoner on her arm? I wasn't gonna let him go anywhere because I thought if I leave him there, you know, I'm not sure if they're gonna just put him in a cell and lock him up. And then next thing you know, you know, we go in and we find him hanging or something. So I took him with me. I did not let go of him until I handed him over to, to, to the person who can actually help him. Thank you. That is a true example of empathy 
and compassion. I'd like to, like to acknowledge uh, a colleague of ours, uh, Philip Drayton, who's locked in this afternoon, right now here, uh, Leslin, and Roxanne Sandy is in the UK, Dr. Dr. Saul was also locked in, and several. All of you uh, who have been making your comments here, we see your comments. Unfortunately, we are unable to address your comments now. We thank you for your comments. We thank you for sharing the go live. I'm certain that uh, Drs. Mark Constantine and Dr. Devendra Sharma would read the comments and at another program we may perhaps explore on all of those because if we were to read and, and, and to look at all those comments and talk about it, it's going to take us quite a while. I just want to share. Matthew, uh, if, if, if I can just uh, make a suggestion, go ahead. Go ahead. Um, you, you know, I'm, I'm a GPHC and I'm responsible for a lot of nurses um, in my position. And um, a lot of nurses were really looking forward to um, talking about uh, mental health due to lockdown, due to COVID, via the increase in violence due to um, isolation and so on. So uh, maybe we can do this, you know, soon again, you know, focus on those, those topics. Well, I have no issues in, in, in doing this program again next week, Monday, and we can look at the comments, we can look at other areas and we can discuss all of those. I'll communicate with the panel during before the end of the week. I just wanted to, to especially for, for viewers and our listeners to share what you can do, and this is for primarily in Guyana, but I guess it applies all over the world, what you can do in terms of the legal aspects. Now, the first thing, if you're in a physically domestic abuse, if you're in a domestic abusive relationship, <clears throat> what you can do is report to the police. The police have recently been having training on how to handle these issues. But you're not only reporting to the police, you report to the police and you get a copy of your report from the police. If you're injured, you seek medical attention and get a copy of the medical report. As both doctors, doctors uh, Constantine and Dr. Sharma were saying, seeking the support of caring people. Tell someone you trust about the abuse. Do not remain silent. It must come out loud and clear. <clears throat> there might be a friend, family member, neighbor, co-worker, staff member, or support agencies. Well, we've discussed what the support agencies here, the human services, mental health unit, and the other NGOs. You do not need to face the abuse alone. And we have to take away what is called in local parlance, the shame, especially for men who think that they will look, be looked down upon. The thing about domestic violence is that you cannot remain silent. Dr. Sherman. Absolutely. Uh, silence is, is uh, Consent. It's not going to help you, your children, your home. And you're not going to help us because we feel it when we know that there is this pain that's going on. So we are all trying to help. You are doing a fantastic job, Mr. Hussein. This is very important that we reach out. We uh, we got good people that are listening. You got Mr. Drayton. You got Dr. Saw. We we got people connected around the world, but we got to be united. So the voice must not only be heard by the victim, the voice must also be spread by us because we got to make this thing happen that we can give them the support that they are seeking. So the first person that they reach out to, if it's the police, they must take it seriously. There are a lot of complaints that police often look down at people who complain about these issues and call them domestic matters and personal yes. issues that they yes. not waste our times. We're dealing with criminals. Um, Yes, you're dealing with criminals and we respect you for that. But we respect you a lot when you, you're listening to our people and you're offering that warmth and that support and that care. Our people are hearing you. But you're very important. That was, uh, as I said, with the Minister of um, Human Services over West Demerara. We spoke and the, the officer and the the commander there was amazing. He says, I am going to listen. I'm going to make any officer who doesn't listen pay the price for not listening. They got to be responsible. So when you take that attitude at the top, yeah. your people below will also take it. So we have to set the example. We have to show our people respect. Yeah. We have to treat them with respect. We cannot minimize their problem. We cannot laugh it off. 
um, and try to get support from other people who will laugh with us. This is not a joke and this is not a laughing matter. And the court also needs to be in tune with us. They need to find, they need to find measures that are not necessarily what I would call punishments, but measures which are able to make the person accountable or being a, a great advocate for persons becoming more accountable for crimes rather than being punished and being put away. It's a waste of that person's life. It's a waste of your resources. We're putting our officers also in prison to watch over them. So you, they may be considered free people, but they're spending their time in prison watching a person who is in jail for a crime that they should be accountable for. I, I strongly believe that persons who commit these crimes need to atone, they need to go into the communities, they need to work, they need to spend their lives paying back to that family that they've traumatized. They, they have a responsibility. Just Thank you. I, up, I, not the way. Go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, that's okay, that's my point. Uh, I just wanna ask uh, uh, Mark, you did counseling in the prisons, you did some work with the prisons. Uh, have you, or is there a program that the people, especially those who would have you know, committed very violent crimes like murder, killing spouses and things like that, uh, were those persons ever psychoanalyzed to figure out what they were thinking, what were their thoughts? Um, absolutely. Actually, I, I, I did some of that myself um, at some of the prison location. But um, apart from that, um, there was there was also the, most of the work that was done was done in large groups because of the large um, population in the prisons. Mm. So we did such things like you know anger management and and uh, and and, um, and conflict resolution and these sort of thing. But yes, there, there was such thing, and I I'm, I'm happy to report that as we speak. Um, their talks and efforts in the pipeline to restart these programs um, in the prison system. And, and I myself would be um, on board with that and, and, and training some of our youngsters to start taking up the task as it relates to, you know, providing these services for inmates in prisons. You see, what happened is that Guyana, we, we have a, a system that we call a penal institutional system, where you commit a crime and, and you're, you're sentenced and you're penalized, so return you're locked away. And there's very little rehabilitative effort. Preparation to come back into general society. To rehabilitate these, these, these offenders, um, to help them to be reintegrated back into society when the time comes to them to do so. And so that, that is one of the reasons why we see we have such a high repeat offender rate also people going in and out of prison because they're not being rehabilitated. And so um, the rehabilitation process is vitally important. So yes, we, we, we did that sort of thing. And as I said, efforts are on the way to get it restarted. Thank you, that is very good news. There, there have been two bits of good news, news sorry, that you shared this evening, Mark, and I'm very elated about that. And I say that also Leslie and Dr. Sharma, and all of us who are listening, those are very exciting pieces of information that you've shared. Now this, 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 let's look at, and, and either Dr. Sharma, and Dr. Leslin and uh, Mark, we can come in at any point in time. Your views on the pandemic lockdown, and does it have any, uh, any effect in the increase of violence, primarily the domestic violence that we have been witnessing in Guyana recently? Uh, emotionally, you know, the, the lockdown, what, how, how does that impact into our society? Mind you, I am not advocating anything against the protocols of COVID-19. I'm talking about not being able to express oneself by going to these recreational facilities and things like that. How is that affecting the animal? Is that one of the reasons that we're seeing some increase in the violence? Either Dr. Sharma or Mark Leslie. Well, let me go first. Um, well, we're okay. seeing that not only in Guyana, we've seen it around the, the world. That um, there is a definitely a, a documented increase in domestic violence. In Argentina, the, the ladies had to go out to demonstrate about this issue 
So it's, um, it's something that's impacting all of our countries. Um, we, we've seen that in Guyana, we've seen that compounded by the alcohol use that happens in, in the homes when people are there sitting with one another. Um, so I, I'm, I'm pretty happy that uh, things are a little bit more open and people can go back outdoors and get back to work and the children can go back outdoors and some normalcy can return because this unnatural locking down for too long is not, not working in anybody's favor. Mark? Um, I, I, yeah, I, I just would like to endorse what Dave said. It, it is definitely something that um, has affected the world over, not only here in Guyana. And what happened is that, um, what I have noticed is that due to the, the isolation that um, persons have been put under, there is a real lack of activities um, for them to be meaningfully engaged in in the home. So it leads to a sense of real frustration. And uh, some people have been known to develop tremendous anxiety issues um, as well. And so as a result of that, it, it has really affected um, uh, a lot of people in a very adverse way. Um, yes, things are going back to a sense of normality to some extent. Um, people still do have to take the necessary precaution. But um, I just would like to say that for individuals who um, have to be isolated for some reason or the other, let's say you have been um, you know, diagnosed with a positive result and you have to be isolated for 14 days as is the norm, you know, find something meaningful to engage in, to occupy your mind with uh, um, sitting around and lazing around with nothing to do um, often leads the mind um, into a state of frustration and 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 um, utmost anxiety and all of that. Uh, and and so you, it's about getting yourself meaningfully engaged into something, perhaps maybe a study or something, or some yard work in your yard. You're allowed to go into your yard if you're living alone, that is, <laughs> and you're the only one diagnosed. Right, good advice. Uh, before I come to lesson, I just want to acknowledge a very strong support of all of our programs. Uh, the Welshman, Stephen Tisby, is locked in, and as usual, he is offering his comments. Um, I hear you, Stephen, is saying that the services have to be easily accessible 24 7 when the person is in desperation and as at a point where their life is endangered. Yes, uh, Stephen, I do acknowledge that, and I hope that we can be able to, to have that in place. But as of now, people can call the hotline. Um, as in we do have helplines. We do have. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. People can call it. People can call the hotlines 24/7. We do have shelters too in Ghana where people can. Yeah, we have the, yeah, privately. Yes. Before the, the yeah, I'm hoping. I'm hoping on the next program I'll get somebody from the other NGOs to talk to us about help and shelter in the other areas and things like that. I want to also acknowledge uh, my program director W.R. Riaz, who was locked in all the way not from in Guyana, and to Dave, das, Dave Daniel Ramdas, who is a health professional in the United Kingdom. And he's been making some comments as well. Dave, I hope that we can address those comments at another program. Leslie, your views and experiences on the lockdown, quarantine, and how it affects us yeah. mentally yeah. and in the so, mm -hmm. so, um. What I'd like to say first, um, you know, we have to acknowledge that um, man or us as human, we're, we're social beings, right? We're, we're social beings and um, we cannot live without, we cannot live without socializing, but we also have to acknowledge that there are boundaries, you know, for all of us, you know, um, even if you're married and you're in, in a real marriage relationship or you're living with someone or you're living with kids and so there's times when you want time away from the kids there's times when you want time away from your partner I, I know Steve is listening you're talking so, about your you're talking <laughs> about your you're talking about your famous phrase me time me, me time. time oh yeah, yeah so Steve is listening and see if it's listening. Listening. so so we we had an experience recently because um i i tested positive for covid 19 um early in the year so i didn't have a very good start to 2022 at all 
Um, however, prior to that, you know, I'm always thinking, oh my gosh, I need a week where I'm alone, where I say nothing to anyone, where I'm just there all by myself. And, you know, and, and I keep, kept going on and on and on. And, you know, that two weeks I had, I didn't know what to do with myself. There was a few days when I was too ill to, um, to, to concentrate on the computer or anything. Um, I was upstairs, downstairs, you know, I would try, I would keep Steve up late because we'll be chatting on WhatsApp. I'm in one room, he's in the other room. And, um, you know, I, I found myself looking at some educational programs, um, National Geographic, um, the Open University, University through the BBC, they do an interesting program on, um, on animals. I particularly looked at one called the hunt. And I well, just, just, to, just took a pill. Let me read this comment. Let's take a pill. Let me read this comment uh, from Steve. Steve is saying the best two weeks he ever had. <laughs> <laughs> for those of you listening, um, listen, do I have permission to say who's Steve? Yes, you can. Listen, uh, Steve is being the Welsh one. He's from Wales. Is Steve is Leslie's spouse. So he's always locked in and he's saying that two weeks that, that Leslie is talking about was the best two weeks he had. I see Marcus smiling. I don't know why, but I want to ask him now. Yeah, um, Steve would always say to me, he said, um, why is it that you have to uh, make everything so scientific? I, I think I, I, I try to get things across for him to understand certain things. Anyway, yes, back to this isolation, you know, um, well, I had a lot of people to talk to because of WhatsApp and so on. But, you know, when I think about it, the week that I always told myself, I need to be alone. I don't want to see anybody. I don't want to speak to anybody. I think that that is not necessarily so. That was just some sort of fantasy in my head because I had the opportunity to isolate for two weeks and it almost killed me <laughs> in doing it. You know, um, so although we're, although we're, um, we're, we're, we're still in, in the pandemic to some extent, I know that, you know, things are getting better and people will be able to socialize a little bit more. I don't think is that, you know, the, the, I don't think that people so hate each other that they can't stand each other, that we're having these um, increase in violence and so on. Um, I just think that there's there's so much misunderstanding when you know when there's too much of everything, you know. Sometimes they say less is more, um, and and Steve know it. So there's times when I come home and I want to be quiet. I'm here, but I want to be quiet. I'm not quite ready for a for a full on conversation. Not a lot of people can deal with that, you know. Steve understands me, so he can he he sort of puts up with that. You know, and if I if I see he's he's quiet, I I stay quiet too. Maybe we just need some time, um, but maybe isolation, lockdown, and so on. Um, you know, people with different experiences and and you know different situation, different home situations, and then things like you know um, uncertainty, financial uncertainty, and so on. There are so many things that can cause a row that can escalate into um, physical violence and not only just an argument so you know i i can't totally relate to um the the domestic violence um due to due to isolation but i think i have an understanding of you know what can cause it um just not being able to 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 create that boundary or to create that among the separation that is necessary you know to for somebody to still feel I'm an individual and you know, and, and I can, you know, this is my space and this is your space, but we can still, you know, be civilized to each other when we're ready to occupy each other's space. Something like that, Nas. I'm not sure if I make Yo, sense. Th but... Thank you very much for your take. Um, as we're here, I just saw somebody that I want to invite next week on this program. So Tora Joseph is with the, the child care um, agency and she's in Burbies and I want to, I am going to invite her next week and we'll talk the legal aspects of the domestic abuse. I'd like also to, to acknowledge my radio colleague, Sophia Dolphin, who is saying that she wished more people would appreciate this information 
so we would all be able to make more informed decisions and seek help. Sophia, for those of you who don't know, does a, re a regular radio program um, every day, and she talks a lot about women, mental health, abuse, and things like that, and I compliment her. I thank her for locking this afternoon. Let me just read uh, something that she just sent here. Mental health education provides necessary awareness and resources for us and loved ones. It helps to break the stigma associated with mental health. Additionally, it can promote efforts for treatment and recovery, and it should be taught in schools as well. Well, Save Me Anna has been advocating teaching mental wellness in schools for the longest while. I'm talking about respect for women, respect for gender, and things like that. So we can go in, uh, we can go in, go on and on and on, but shortly we'll have to wrap up. So I want to give Dr. Sharma as much time as you want to take to do a wrap up here. And we're going to do Mark next and then Leslie, and after then I'll have to go and get something to eat. It's going to be dinner time. So I had a look at some of the statistics and um, I'm not too excited to see that we actually have it um, in, in 2020, I think there were 1,692 reported cases. Reports made, sorry, reports were made, 1,692. And of those, 893 became documented cases. So I got this off the internet, so maybe Mark might correct me. But what I'm seeing out of that um, is that only 112 of those cases were brought to trial and had a result. So when you look at the original number of 1,692, you got 112 cases coming to trial. Well, what is what is that? You know, if that's correct, that is not right. Something is not correct there. So maybe Mark, you might tell me if those facts are correct. But it's coming off the internet, so that's the data I saw. I pulled out. So using that, I'm saying that we don't have to take every case to trial. Maybe. A lot of those cases were resolved through social work. And I'm hoping that's the solution that happened, that we don't have to necessarily see them go to trial. And there is this punishment program that is applied. My take on this issue is that we have to hold people accountable. And the system is not operating right. I, I can challenge anybody in the legal system to show me what are your evidence that your system is working right. That punishing people alone is not the solution. There must be punishment, I fully agree, but there must also be accountability. People have to pay a price. Those who are doing these wicked deeds and I'm talking about the really vile wicked deeds of domestic violence, they must pay a price. And they, it's not just being locked away in a cell. That is just a, 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 a making people feel a sense of satisfaction. I've done the job, he's gone, or she's gone out of societies. They're going to come back. It's not the solution. So we got to find a different way to deal with this. And uh, you know, I, I, Mark, I'm sure you'll agree for your experience with the prison that many of those cases take years before they actually be, be determined. You know, what are you doing keeping somebody on remand for so long? Five, seven, eight years before they actually, what happened to the case? People have forgotten about it. You know, what kind of legal system do we have? It's not Guyana knocking, it's everywhere. I, I have no, you know, I'm very annoyed with the way the legal system operates. Uh, I want to give the kudos to the attorney general. I know they're working for law reform, and I think that's the way forward. And I think people like you, Mark, people like you, Leslie, and you in the media, we got to work together to make a new way forward. We have to also learn to educate people as to the importance of recognizing that their brain health, which we call mental health, is significantly important, is the most important part of our being. We neglect it. 
because we feel embarrassed about emotional problems. It, it has to change. It has to change by people in the schools changing them. We have to counter bullyism in the school. They, they get away with being bullies in the school, or when they get away with it, they're going to grow up and become bullies. In but that is what school. we're seeing in the society presently. Yeah, they become bullies in their homes, they become political bullies, they become bullies all over the place. Uh, you got to stand up to these bullies at the grassroots, at the, the level where they started out, and our schools have to become accountable. So there's a lot of accountability, yes, we want to change, we have to make the change, we have to walk the talk. So I, I look forward to keep working with you, Mr. Hussein, I, I'm really truly delighted to be with you. It's a start. We can't expect change to happen tonight, but hopefully we, we're going to find a way. That you're going to tell me how we can reach those people who are there drinking away, merrily, having a great time. And I did, they should have a great time. Don't, don't get me wrong. I don't want anybody feeling against people who drink and have a good time. You know, So let's have a good time, but let's be responsible. Let's don't neglect our homes. Neglect our kids, neglect our families, neglect our work. We got a lot of work to do to build our country. This Ghana is on the way up, but we don't want it to be a way up materially. We want it to be on the way up with all health intact, the physical health as long as well as the people's emotional health. So I wish I wish everyone, all our listeners, I know they're good, good people listening. I want to wish you the best. Um, let's try to work together, keep our country as safe as we can. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Sharma. Don't leave us yet, of course. Very excellently allocated. I like that. Um, I like especially the part where you reiterated that you're not knocking persons who are having a good time. You must have a good time. <laughs> it, it helps to, to develop your coping skills and your self-esteem. I'd just like to acknowledge a friend of mine, uh, Walter Narayan, the Solid Waste Management Disposal Director of the Maine Town Council and to remind our audience and listeners to join us tomorrow 6 p.m. for Coast to Coast Talk Back. Our topic is going to be waste disposal and the environment. And the lead panelist will be Mr. Walton Ryan, the domestic, the, the waste management director of the Mayan City Council. And I'm hoping to have someone from the EPA as well. And we will explore that because <laughs> If we were to go longer, we would see how we can, we can, there's an, there's a, a, an annex, there's a nexus between good health, mental wellness, and a good environment and a safe environment. And this is where our garbage disposal comes in. Uh, but tomorrow evening, six o'clock, we'll talk about that. I don't know if I should give Mark the preference now in front of Leslin. Um, Leslin may have to prepare a meal for for Steve and herself shortly. So Leslie, your closing remarks. Um, I would like to close by saying, um, you know, for persons out there who, you know, are in situations where they know that, you know, there is something, there is something in the air, there is, there is, something they can feel it they know it they, they've been through it or they're going through it um you know one way or the other they, there is help out there um i'm glad you shared those numbers earlier um i i didn't have time today to look up um i know that um through the human services that there was some new numbers shared recently by um dr vindia facade's um office yes. But maybe we can, um, you know, still share those numbers, you know, let people know that it is important to talk, <laughs> you know, even if you don't want to talk um, face to face and um, <clears throat> initially, uh, persons can reach out, um, continue to share our number nice. And I do believe, I know that the pandemic has stopped us from doing um, our good work and I wish to see um, we get back out there. Um, continue and to continue doing our work. While we were talking, while you were talking earlier, I recalled um, you said about abuses both ways. You know, not only um, meted out to women, but also meted out to men. And I don't know if you can recall, we were in Barbies one 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 time, and um, 
the same lady from Barbies that you mentioned earlier. That the Thor Joseph, yes, so I remember, yes, I remember Fora, that, yeah. that, that outreach we went the on. Fora, yes. yes, and I think it was a policeman and he was in, he, yes. he, he was in awe of the information. Um, he stood up and he cried and he was saying in tears that, you know, he is glad to have had, you know, this awareness um, brought to them because he never knew that he can cry as a man. And, and he was just, he, I, he just felt like he had to let all the tears out that day. I don't know if you can remember that. In yeah, this was, this, was a, this was an outreach, a workshop that we did at Carifferton. Yes, yes. yes. And, um, you know, and he even shared with us some of his experience and how he bottled up everything and he would hit out because he didn't think, you know, that he could show emotions. So there Listen, was- Listen, I have, I, have I have to laugh here now. Steve's saying he's starving. <laughs> Steve is such a, such a hilarious guy. Go ahead, Anil, go ahead. Let's starve a little bit more. <laughs> <laughs> yes, so, um, you know, it is important for us to get back out there um, you know, meet people, um, raise the awareness, let people know, you know, how they can access help, help them to get help, um, you know, do what we do best. Yes, indeed. I'm hoping, um, I didn't want to really blow our trumpet for what Safe Guyana Suicide and Violence Eradication Guyana has been doing. Uh, we were precluded basically by the lockdown, the COVID uh, pandemic, and uh, <laughs> I'm going to mention this. We were also having issues with funding. So what we did was both myself, Leslie, and other colleagues, we self-funded. Uh, we were spending our own monies to travel, uh, to buy meals and things like that. But we, we were we real passionate about what we want to do. So we took uh, mental health awareness and domestic violence awareness programs, Esquibo, Region 8. We did secondary schools in Esquibo. We did all of the secondary schools in Burbese. We did the sugar estates in Burbese. Uh, we, we are not in the habit of wanting to, to have a payback from any agency, or, but we must promote our work. We're not looking for any personal kudos. We're passionate about what we want to do in Safe Guyana. And I'm happy that we have associate colleagues like Dr. Dave and Dr. Mark Constantine, who at the flick of a finger would accept an invite to share their expertise. We've had others from other agencies who also joined with us. I also want to pay credit to <clears throat> Philip Drayton, who was also with us. But what we've found since the, the pandemic started and become so, well, pandemic, since the pandemic, is that we, can no, we were no longer able to go and do our physical awareness programs. And this is where I'm going to, well, I don't want to take anything. This is where myself, as a radio and television presenter, I've been using my programs to get experts like Dr. Sharma and Dr. Constantine and others to join us. Because from my experience, I've also discovered that social media is a very powerful tool for creating awareness. So I'm happy, I'm pleased of what we're doing. I'm privileged to be able to be in good health, thank to God, to still be able to convene these programs. And I'm more privileged to have good colleagues, friends, and associates like Mark and Dave and you, Leslie, and others who will join us from time to time. Mark, I've spoken enough. I want to give you an opportunity for your final remarks. All right, thank you very much, Nazim. Um, you know, if I should say this, and, and it was mentioned that domestic abuse and by extension, domestic violence does not work one way, it goes both ways. Um, we know by now that a lot of men are facing abuse as well. But um, I just want to say that it's important to look for the signs. Signs are always there. And sometimes people ignore the signs. And know um, what they are. You know, we, we did not get the chance to talk about all the different forms of domestic abuse. Um, but I, I, want, I want to really point out one very important one that I know a lot of people are facing with, and that's the social isolation abuse. And there are a lot of people um, whom are being socially isolated, and, and it has been done under the, the pretext of, oh, I, I want to um, protect you.
from individuals and that's why I'm, I'm doing this, you know, but it is really a move to isolate you from, from friends and family and loved ones. And, and once you see it, the individual starts to get that control, it's going to move to the next level. Um, they want you to, to start to become 100% dependent on them by cutting you off from the rest of the world. Um, and and, and, and the, the, the real objective a lot of times is to cut you off from anyone or anything that they believe is going to solve What, what's the word that I'm looking for that, that would serve as a support system to you at any point? So they want to cut you off from that. So your dependency must be on them and them alone. And, and this means, and, and you know, social isolation abuse is not just about cutting you off from friends and family and colleagues physically. We're talking about running your phone, wanting to know who you're talking to, going on your, your Facebook account now that we have social media. Checking, checking in to see who you talked to, who visited you. And, and, and it can go on and it can, can go on and it can go on. But take note of it because it is a serious form of abuse that, that exists and people are taking it for granted and think, oh, people are doing it because, you know, um, they want to protect me and they care about me and all of that. And it's not always the case. Yes, there's an there's a issue of uh, young marriages and people partners who you know, would want to prevent you from visiting your parents, your loved ones, uh, talking to people. And these are, these are the, if I might be here, so I, I, I stand corrected, these are the initial stages and it, it, it climbs up. The, 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 the current right. goes up because it starts from there. And this is why it's right. important. It's important for people to understand where the beginning of domestic violence and what level it can reach to. And there, there, there have been so many cases that we've experienced only recently in Guyana, where uh, only recently a woman was burned, and now I understand she died, and a young lady was stabbed in Sapphire. All of these are because of you are subjected to the isolation aspect and the gaslighting part of domestic violence. And whilst I do not profess to be any real expert in the issue, it's always something that I'm passionate about, so I do a bit of research and I do understand that. Um, one of the things that uh, we need to recognize is that these days, and Mark, you alluded to it, to get information on any particular topic, layman's information, it's easy now because of social media, you can go and look at them. If you think that domestic abuse is starting, you cannot remain silent. You must speak out. You must let your voice be heard because when you remain silent, you are an accessory of that violence. Mark, continue. Yes, so as I was saying, um, look for the signs, um, seek help, take nothing for granted. Um, help is available, as we would have mentioned before. And I would just like to take the opportunity in closing to thank you, Nazim, for the wonderful work that you're doing my colleague Dave and, and Leslin and, and all the others. And uh, let us continue to work hand in hand. Um, if we're going to win this battle in any way, it would require all hands on deck and it would require collective effort um, because it is something that is, is not going away. Just look at it this way. Um, domestic abuse and domestic violence has its aids. It has its aid. Social media is an aid. The music today is an aid. New movies that we see today, it's an aid. And if it's getting the aid and the help, then we need to help each other to be able to curtail it as well. Thank you very much, Mark. I am truly humbled by your kind remarks about myself. Uh, I thank you very much. I want to thank my panelists this evening. Uh, Dr. Sharma, who did his MBBS in Amstrad, Punjab, postgrad at UK and UWI holding a doctorate in medicine. He is uh, currently attached as a consultant for the neurobehavior medicine at Woodlands and St. Joseph Mercy Hospital with an immense track record of community service. And this evening, that community service was very evident. Mark Constantine, doctor, clinical psychology counselor, uh, who's attached right now to the mental health unit. He does private counseling as well as involved in so many activities. And Leslie Holder, assistant director 
Nursing Services, <coughs> excuse me, Vice President, Suicide and Violence Eradication, Indiana. Lady and gentlemen, I want to thank you. I'm truly happy that you decided to accept the invite and to be on the program this evening. I want to thank my sponsors also for this for being on the program this evening. The Nature of Experience at 41 Rock Street, Raise Motor Spears and Auto Sales, A Ahmed Hydraulics at Bagotstown and Modern Optical Services. They're the persons that have been sponsoring the program today. My technical coordinator is Nicholas Samaru from Graphics Studio 2000 and my program director, Debbie Arias. Do have a pleasant and wonderful evening, a very restful night. Do remember to observe all of the COVID-19 protocols and tomorrow's promise to no one. So if you can do a good deed, do it now. I thank you, I bid you farewell, and I wish you have a very restful night and a good day at work tomorrow. Join us tomorrow evening at 6 p.m. for Coast to Coast Talk Mac, Environment and Garbage Disposal, and God's willing, next Monday again for another edition of Talks on Domestic Violence and Mental Health. Thank you very much. Until then, pranam, salam, good evening.